Well, good afternoon from Ithaca, New York, home of Cornell University. Today, we're talking all about the places you stay when traveling. Yes, I'm talking about hotels and the different varieties you can choose from. Joining us is the perfect guest to talk about this topic, one of my favorite guests, Professor Chekatan Dev from the Nolan School of Hotel Administration. Chekatan also happens to be faculty author of several of our certificate programs, and he'll also be part of our professional development program in, do- in June. Chekatan, it's so great to have you, have you back. Good to be with you, Nick. All right. So I just want to kind of baseline our conversation. It's been a little while. So I want to kind of dive right in. So most of us can name the big hotel companies like the Marriott's, the Hilton's, the Hyatt's, the Wyndham's, all that good stuff. But when we're talking about brands, what are some well-known hotel brands that fall under these large companies? Managing brands profitably has become the central organizing principle of most hospitality organizations, guiding every decision and every action. Hotel companies have assembled expansive brand portfolios, Hilton with 19, Marriott with 31, once it adds City Express, and Accor with 43 lodging brands and counting. And they're doing this for these three reasons. One, to command total shelf space that accrues to the brand portfolio on any distribution platform so they can capture more than their fair share, that is Accor, as an example. Refer business to another brand in the same family if one happens to be sold out, like Marriott so Marriott brands, and cover any gaps in the portfolio, for example, Signia by Hilton to appeal to convention planners, Hua Lux by IEG tailored to China's domestic market. Mm-hmm. In the 40 plus years I've spent studying hotel brands, I've learned that the three key prerequisites to picking the right brand come down to one, the fit between the market opportunity and the brand position, mm-hmm. two, a brilliant brand strategy and record of performance, and three, an agreement of what ongoing support will come from the brand. When that doesn't happen, that's where the problem starts. One lawsuit in which I served as an expert was based on item three. The brand decided to support another brand in direct competition with an existing owner and lost the case. So there's a lot of activity going on, a lot of companies creating a lot of brands, a lot of individual brands that are being uh, served on the market and sometimes operate independently or sometimes being acquired by a large brand family. And you're talking a little bit about you know your extensive uh, history in this industry. Has this always been the case that there's been so many different types of brands or is this kind of a new phenomenon? So this is a relatively new phenomenon in terms of just the explosion in the number of brands. About 30 years ago, by my count, there were a few hundred hotel brands. Now there are more than a thousand, according to Smith Travel Research's brand list. A good way to think about brand proliferation is to calculate the ratio of brands to branded hotel rooms. So for instance, take your our audience to a little math here. In 1990, of a total of about 10 million hotel rooms, where about 20% were branded, or about 2 million, there were about 300 brands, so a coverage ratio of about 0.15. In 2020, I count about 17 million hotel rooms, and about 7 million rooms of those were branded, about 40%, and about 1,000 brands, giving us a brand rate coverage ratio of 0.14. So by this measure, the brand coverage ratio has held steady worldwide in the past three decades. The problem isn't too many brands, but too many brands that look and feel like many other brands, what I'm calling a confusing sea of sameness. And how many of these brands ride in each other's lane, so to speak? One way to think about this sort of lane intrusion, if you will, is to think about tiers or levels in which brands are organized. So in 1990, about 300 brands were organized in five tiers, budget, economy, mid-scale, upscale, luxury, akin to the one to five star system used around the world. So about 60 brands per tier, give or take. By 2020, these tiers have been cut into narrower slices. For example, hard budget, budget, upper budget, economy, upper economy, lower mid-scale, mid-scale, upper mid-scale, and so on, for about 12 tiers with over a thousand brands fighting for shelf space or slices, 80 brands per tier creates a very crowded and confusing marketplace. In this environment, it is inevitable that brands, even some within the same firm, are stepping over each other's lanes. Wow. And I you know, read a little bit of your piece in the Wall Street Journal where you mentioned this kind of sea of sameness concept. One thing that jumped out to me was, like you mentioned before, it was only about kind of five tiers as far as the market goes. But can you kind of help us understand just how surgical some of these hotel chains are getting with customers? So like you mentioned, not just the economy um, customer, but premium economy or not just the luxury 
brand, but a classic luxury brand. How surgical are some of these hotel chains getting? Terrific. So picking up on the earlier point, the fact that these tiers or price points or levels of the market are being uh, sliced and diced into narrow and narrow groups, if we define bl brand bloat by the number of brands stepping on each other's swim lanes and confusing the customer, then mm -hmm. definitely is bland, brand bloat. The sea of sameness brands are swimming in is only getting more bewildering for consumers. For some time now, the hospitality brandscape has been undergoing a shakeout, creating tremendous opportunities for brands to define themselves. For example, Sonesta recently acquired a bunch of brands that's trying to become better known, repositioning to a better sweet spot of the market, Hyatt Place mm -hmm. becoming more home-like, merging with adjacent brands to build market power at top and all seasons for a core merging with Ibis, and kill some brands that have outlived their useful lives, IG phased out, Holiday and Select, and create brands for which white space exists. For example, SH Hotels, one hotel brand. So there are, as you say, as you correctly pointed out, you know, smaller and smaller niche markets, smaller and smaller subgroups for which companies are creating brands. And that I expect will continue. And is there crossover with all these different types of brands trying to focus on specific customer bases? So I'm thinking um, somebody who might be interested in premium economy versus economy. Is there crossover when it comes to customers trying to figure out exactly what brand they want to go with? There is. Uh, there's lots of research that talks about the choice of brands sometimes is driven by purpose of travel. So, for example, mm -hmm. a, in, an individual might choose a, a, a premium economy brand for business travel, an economy brand for their personal travel. So they might mm -hmm. cut across brands in terms of the purpose that they're using and, and who's paying for that, uh, for that experience. Other than that, you know, clearly their mm -hmm. consumers have to try to figure out of all the options given all the price points, especially when the price points across firms can blur, which might be the best uh, slice to choose within and then which brand within that slice gets a little confusing. And just a quick follow-up, as we're talking a little bit about customers and everything like that, what customer base lends itself to more brands, would you say? So one of the more animated conversations in the last several years about hotel branding has to do with the lifestyle branding. And that is hotels are in a, that are in a crowded and brutally competitive market, mm -hmm. go brand with lifestyle brands to give them that extra oomph to stand out from the crowd. The mm -hmm. rise of the millennial generation plays into this trend, powered by social media sites like Instagram and TikTok. Mm -hmm. Millennials love lifestyle brands, especially <laughs> those that have a unique point of view. Turning mm -hmm. an otherwise bland, boxy, and boring hotel into a lifestyle branded hotel serves to mm -hmm. attract those millennials that want a little more from a hotel. Mm -hmm. Because lifestyle brands are easily well-suited to and sometimes birthed by social media, mm -hmm. millennials are a natural target for them. W is a good example of a brand that tried to embed itself into a customer's lifestyle, not only with stylish amenities and services at each hotel, but items I could purchase to live the W life at home. AC and Moxie from Marriott are examples of affordably priced lifestyle brands that seem to be gaining market share. I'm definitely one of those millennials who likes that uh, lifestyle brand hotel. I really do. Um, I was recently in Florida and I was just blown away by some of the different hotel chains down there. I wasn't in Miami, but close. I was in Orlando. So um, yeah, really, really sold beyond those. Um, what do you think of these you know, major companies trying to push so hard to develop new brands? So like you mentioned a little bit earlier, trying to get a really, really surgical when it comes to a specific customer base. Um, what do you think about this concept? So the short, short answer to the question is why are these hotel companies creating so many brands? And the, 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 I said the shorter answer is because they can. <laughs> The longer answer is the branding of the hotel industry is a global phenomenon for several reasons. The principal ones being the customer's desire for a predictable and consistent product and service experience, economies of scale in advertising distribution, and market power in negotiating with buyers. Over the past 30 years, most hotel firms have become asset light, where they don't own the hotels, but just brand or flag them. Each brand represents a stream of income for the company. In this evolution, the hotel owner is a primary customer for hotel firms, not the guest. For a firm to grow, it must either sign up more owners for each of its brands or create more brands when existing brands have saturated the market. One lawsuit in which I was involved and recently had to do with the brand creating an extension 
without honoring the rights of an existing owner. When that happens, then trouble ensues. And what would you say is the overall driving force behind creating some of these new brands, like you mentioned, over a thousand, I think, worldwide? On the demand side, hotel brand proliferation is partly driven by unserved or underserved markets, such as wellness, even hotels by IG, eco luxury, one hotels by SH hotels, high tech self service, fly zoo hotels by Alibaba. On the supply side, one factor driving the rapid proliferation of brands is that some brands have given up their market rights to owners in particular geographic locations. As a workaround, mm -hmm. Global hotel groups sometimes try to penetrate a local market by further introducing new brands or other brands. A case in point, KMS, the owner of the Ritz-Carlton Bali Resort and Spa, had signed a contract with Ritz-Carlton, which had agreed not to compete with or assist the competitors of a property within the Ritz-Carlton Bali's market. The owner sued Marriott for doing an end run around the hotel management agreement by launching a new brand, Bulgari Hotels and Resorts, wow. in Bali. KMS, assisted by me, sued Ritz Carlton for breach of contract, and the jury awarded KMS $10 million. This is a matter of public record. There's an article written wow. on the subject. And so that's when sometimes this force to create new brands goes a little bit off the rails. Not all mm -hmm. contracts give hotel owners such strong legal rights. In fact, that's starting to diminish. Sometimes mm -hmm. call an area protection or radius clause to protect the territory. In those cases, Launching an additional brand and soft brands can sometimes enable large hotel groups to expand into markets where they already have some presence. New market areas, such as Hudson Yards in New York City, multi-use mm -hmm. development, can create openings for new brands, such as Equinox, a brand that mm -hmm. I work with, because they newly built Greenfield Project without established hotels. And while we're you know talking a little bit about the different brands and everything like that. I read in an article recently that you have an acronym for brand. And when we're thinking about hotels, what do each of these letters mean? Again, B-R-A-N-D. So when I teach my brand management course at Cornell, I try to give my students easy way to remember some of the key lessons from mm -hmm. uh, looking at brands and sort of separate the best from the rest. Mm -hmm. The 40 or so years I've spent uh, studying and learning about branding in general and also branding within the hospitality space, I've come up with sort of an easy way to remember sort of the five uh, elements that make for successful brands. The B in brand stands for bold. A bold brand is one that has the courage to stake out a meaningful, progressive, and sustainable point of view. Think one hotels. R is for relevant. A relevant brand is one that is obsessed with creating value for its customers and other stakeholders by being useful, easy to use, and innovative. Think Virgin Hotels. Authentic. An authentic brand is one that is true to its core competence, transparent in its actions, and responsive to stakeholders. Think Ace. Novel. A novel brand is new, fresh, and disruptive. Think mm -hmm. Citizen M. And Distinct. A distinct mm -hmm. brand is different, unique, and in a category by itself, and or creates a category Think fly, fly Zoo by Alibaba. So brand the acronym B for bold, R for relevant, A for authentic, N for novel, and D for distinct. And if you can achieve these five pillars or these five elements of a brand, you're on your way to being successful. And I want to focus on one of these letters, A for authentic. In the article you mentioned, staying true to your origin story, how can some of these major hotel companies really with deep histories balance kind of staying true to their core brand while at the same time kind of producing new brands and trying to stay relevant to new customer bases? So your question makes me think of a study done by McKinsey for Ralph Lauren many years ago that showed that they could easily extend their brands to hotels. So oh, wow. companies that are doing very systematic analysis, thinking about how their authenticity translates to other product categories, I think is a helpful first step in trying to figure out if in fact the new creation or the new category or new extension will somehow carry over the authenticity of the core brand. Since then, I've observed brands such as Bulgari, Armani, Versace, Chiruti, all have opened hotels with mixed success. What luxury lifestyle brands have become to realize is that running a hotel well is not easy and a bad hotel could easily damage their brand. So this mm -hmm. is sort of the counterpoint. I see this trend continuing, but I also see a lot of casualties lo along the way. For hotel mm -hmm. brands, this trend means that hotels have to up their game. Just as lifestyle brands are making inroads into the legacy hotel business, Hotels have to play the lifestyle brand game, which is what a lot of them are doing, and get more savvy about offering products and services that envelop their guests, 
both while they're in-house and when they're not. And just real quick, audience, thank you for your questions. I know we've started to get some questions in, and we will get to those when we um, wrap up uh, about 15 minutes before. Um, but just thinking about, you know, kind of the customer base and everything like that, one thing I thought of, Chucky, was is there a certain customer base maybe that's being underserved or maybe overserved? So I'm thinking are a lot of these hotel companies focusing really heavily on the economy customer or the luxury customer. Um, so what uh, customer market would you say is being influenced the most or being targeted the most rather? So a fair question and it's also very geography dependent. So okay. at one point I did a study for a company that showed that the, the demand for hotel rooms look like a uh, normal distribution. So you have mm -hmm. some at the low end, some at the very high end, and a lot in the middle, which as you can expect. Mm -hmm. And we found that the supply in that market was, while the demand was a uh, normal curve, so sort of an inverted U, the mm -hmm. supply was a U shape. So mm -hmm. there was very little at the low end, very little at the high end, and, and I'm sorry, a lot at the low end, a lot at the high end, and very little at the middle. So the middle was the one that was underserved. In some markets, it's about uh, having an oversupply of luxury brands. Uh, a lot of Asian cities are a good example of that and not enough uh, mid-scale and economy offerings. In other markets, there's an abundance of luxury brands and not enough at the mid-scale and the low-end market. So to contrast, uh, say, a, a, a dynamic uh, Asian market like New Delhi, for example, or Mumbai, you think about mm. Miami Beach that has a lot of luxury hotels and hotel brands coming up and maybe not enough representation in the middle and the lower tiers. Interesting. And um, one thing I want to kind of switch gears a little bit when we're talking about, you know, customers and everything like that, what connection can be made between investing in research and development from a hotel company's perspective and success of a new brand? So how can we draw that connection? So one of the things that I forecast will be more important in the years ahead is research and development. So I think back to when I started the business almost 45 years ago, revenue management was practiced, practiced with a chalk and a blackboard. In fact, <laughs> I remember a blackboard behind the front desk that had three columns. It was the for sale column, on request column, and the sold out column. And mm -hmm. essentially each column had dates. Fast forward to 2023 and you have very sophisticated uh, AI machine learning based revenue management systems. And you also have, used to have a revenue manager almost at every property now, they're usually regions or clusters. So it's become a very sophisticated discipline. I think I see the same thing happening with research and development. And that is having a position in a hotel or region or an area where R&D is a much bigger part, innovation is a much bigger part of a hotel's uh, future. Mm -hmm. The research and development innovative dilemma as it pertains to hotel brands is as follows. You know, owners want a cookie cutter hotel that can transition from one brand to another without a significant property improvement plan, sometimes called PIP, P-I-P, whereas brand managers want a unique hotel that does not look or feel like any other. So there's sort of the tension is mm -hmm. if I'm an owner, I want a brand, I want a property that is easily, you know, transferable if I need to change my brand and don't get locked in or held hostage by a specific brand. As a brand manager, I want my look and feel to be unique. Mm -hmm. Smart brands finesse this by having a standard physical structure, quote unquote hardware, but distinct systems, processes, and culture, software. So Four Seasons and Oberoi are good examples of this. Ultimately, the primary customer for hotel, a lot of these hotels is not the guest, as I mentioned, but the owner. It is the owner that's footing the bill. So brands have to convince owners to invest in research and development by showing the payoff from such investments. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, brands will steal so sometimes it's creating this research and development, kind of a side note of this, which your uh, viewers and listeners might be interested in, that is sometimes there's so much pressure to do this R&D that brands or firms end up stealing intellectual property. So I was involved oh, wow. in a case, I can't give you the details, it's not <laughs> the course. domain, but there was a case where executives from one company stole millions of pages of documents pertaining to a brand that they then took their new, to their new employer because the new employer was very interested in creating a brand in that space. So that could wow. be, uh, that's kind of a little bit R&D gone off the rails, but that yeah. caused some trouble. But the pressure is going to get even worse because mm -hmm. 
Services by definition are copyable. It's very hard to get intellectual property protection around uh, service brands. Mm -hmm. And so the only way to stay ahead of the market is innovation. And I see that some sort of new and interesting, you know, I'll maybe finish on this point, and that is it's not surprising to me that many companies, married included, have created innovation labs. And they're really putting mm -hmm. the pressure on trying to ask the question, how can my tomorrow be better than my yesterday? Mm -hmm. And that's going to continue. And with that, Sue, do you think that's a direct result of this brand bloating, like you mentioned a couple minutes ago? Yeah. So one of the things that's happening is, uh, well, that, with that lawsuit, what happened was that the company B, let's call it, company mm -hmm. B was restrained from creating a brand in that category because the judge found that the materials from company A had been misappropriated. So mm -hmm. that sort of stopped the clock for them for about two, three years before they could do that. But other companies have realized that as and when a, a tier or a space within a market becomes viable, mm -hmm. everybody rushes in at the same time. And when they all rush at the same time, at least for the short term, you have a lot of oversupply and tremendous brand bloat. Mm -hmm. And as we're thinking about R&D, I want you to kind of put your, put your owner hat on here for a quick second. Um, if you were, you know, the owner of a major hotel brand, what's one area you would want to focus your R&D primarily on? Would it be, you know, the guest experience or, you know, the effectiveness of checking in? What's one area you would really, really want to focus R&D on? So brand upgrade or brand standard upgrades and renovations can either crush a hotel or help reposition into a more desirable sweet spot. Typically, the tension is between the brand's desire to add costly bells and whistles to the hotel in the belief that consumers will reward the hotel with increased business, so more is better, and the hmm. hotel owner's desire to minimize cost to boost profit. So there's that tension between the owner and the brand. The key is for the brand to test the upgrade, improvement, innovation to determine the payoff to the owner from the improvement. My own research has shown that certain amenities create value for the brand and the owner. This is in the articles that are published, while others are simply expensive indulgences that end up destroying the owner's bottom line. A lawsuit mm -hmm. in which I served as an expert involved the owners investing in amenities and not getting the promised payoff because the brand is overpromised. Another way to answer your question is I was part of a, organizing a conference where one of the participants mentioned that they'd done a study and they looked at the payoff from renovations and say, the, the lobby, the rooms, and the shared areas like F&B and others. And what they found was that, at least in their study, the, the sense of arrival, the lobby dollar-for-dollar uh, dollar investment had a higher payoff. The challenge there being that if you enter a hotel that has a new lobby and yet mm -hmm. has an old, tired room, then that causes sort of a, a little cognitive dissonance. So I think thinking about carefully about where the payoff is going to be uh, is something that I think a skill set that companies are getting more and more uh, getting smarter about. That has definitely happened to me before. I've walked in, I've been like, wow, this lobby is amazing. It's great. And then you open the room, you open your room and it's like, oh, I don't know about this room. I don't know about this stay. So yeah, I've, I've been there with you. And what are some features that can really make a brand stand out to a customer from others maybe riding in the same lane? So one of the ways in which brands in a, especially the crowded and recrowded as lucrative lane can stand out is really doing a surgical analysis of what are the features currently on offer in that lane mm -hmm. that are out of favor and what are the features that are currently not either offered in the form that they need to be offered in or not offered at all. Mm -hmm. So one example that stands out in my mind, that example I use in my classes, mm -hmm. is when Virgin Hotels decide to enter the, let's loosely say, the four-star market in, in the U.S., is they found that there were a lot of annoyances and a lot of pain points mm -hmm. that customers were experiencing in the in that four-star tier. And what they decided to do is come up with a, a new package that got rid of a lot of the old pain points and got included a lot of the new pain points and you know simple things like plugs and where they are and, and charging stations all the way to extras on a bill. At the low end of the market, an example I think of is Citizen M, where Citizen M looked at the uh, kind of affordable economy tier of the market and asked the question, what are currently brands offering that are either obsolete or no longer relevant, and what could we offer them that might be a new and interesting way to appeal to that market? Mm -hmm. 
So I think one of the challenges for every brand in every tier is not only looking at your customers and what they're asking and keep asking the question, you know, what they're, uh, what they're looking for. I often have this conversation with my GMs and I'll say when you're walking a guest, a VIP guest to the room and they say to you, so what's new? <laughs> not an, it's not a irrelevant question, not a, not a, yeah. you know, perfunctory question. It's really asking what's new as in, mm -hmm. What have you done since my last visit to increase my pleasure coefficient? And what have you done since the last time I was here to reduce my pain coefficient? So I think, mm -hmm. so the three things I would do is the brands are looking at their own customers mm -hmm. and finding out what's going to be more relevant. Uh, sometimes a signal from that is what they're experiencing mm -hmm. in their own homes. So it's not uncommon for a brand to take cues from what the customers are doing in their homes. That might be a, a key for a hotel. Looking at competitors um, and looking at who else is doing what they're doing, keeping abreast of competitive friends. And then also looking at disruptors is who's a kind of a quote unquote non-hotel brand that's coming in into that space and making a noise and trying to disrupt the lane. And sometimes they have the better ideas that might be worth examining. And then, of course, I say you must innovate, but if you can't in innovate, at least you must try to imitate mm -hmm. and then try to take it to sort of a one plus one level. It sounds like when you're you know, talking about these hotel brands and trying to separate themselves, is it safe to say that even small changes can make a huge difference? So I think you mentioned like the various plugs and things like that. And I'm thinking of, you know, hotel rooms I've stayed at the past with um, my two year old. Um, when it comes to these brands standing out, can small changes really make a huge difference? Absolutely. In fact, many years ago, uh, Sheraton, the Sheraton Hotel brand used to have a slogan or a brand tagline that said, little things mean a lot. And they were pinpointing exactly what you just pointed out. In fact, I was in a seminar one time in a workshop being conducted by Ken Blanchard, a proud Cornell alumnus and the author of The One Minute Manager, who I remember said at that conference that he disagreed with Sheraton. And... Mm -hmm. To say little things mean a lot is incorrect because little things sometimes mean everything. Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, that tagline has sort of since been rehashed by other brands over time. So clearly, absolutely, that, uh, you know, it's it's the little things that sometimes make all the difference. And the smartest companies are paying attention to not just the big things, but also every little thing along the customer's journey and literally trying to map out every step that the mm -hmm. customer takes and asking the question, can that one particular engagement with the customer be made more better, more efficient, more effective. And that sometimes taken together makes for a, a good collective brand experience. And how in-depth do some of these major hotel brands get when they're thinking about developing a new brand regarding their customers? Do they get really, really precise into customers' lives or do they think about it generally or how precise do they get? From my studying and, as I said, being a student of hotel brands for the last 40 plus years, there's quite a range. Uh, and mm -hmm. I have to say that there's a range all the way from simply simply creating a new, a new logo with some maybe meetings or exchanges of PowerPoint decks to launch a brand. Um, I, again, a case that I can't mention of a company that decided that they would try to create a new brand. Mm -hmm. And the way they did it was sort of... Uh, it was more shorthand and felt a little bit rushed and got into trouble because when they finally announced the brand, it uh, violated the rights of an existing owner. And there was a big lawsuit uh, wow. to, the, to the owner's benefit. Another case was when the brand decided it would launch a brand, but didn't put the resources necessary to support the brand and decided to use the resources of an adjacent brand to try to kind of bring this brand to life. And that was sort of short-sighted because, and again, it's a, Chicken and I probably because you have the mm -hmm. resources first and then create the brand or you have the brand, build a critical mass of owners who pay fees and then have the mm -hmm. resources. And in that case, uh, clearly they got called out on the fact that they are uh, misusing the resource of an adjacent brand to mm -hmm. serve the their brand owner that violated the rights of an existing owner. So it can vary. I've seen you know, very detailed. So one case study I use in my class uh, is an article in Interfaces Magazine. Uh, this mm -hmm. is from a few years ago when Marriott created Courtyard, for example. That was a textbook example of how you use the ex absolute state-of-the-art, uh, at the time, knowledge of how brands are created. They use something called coin joint analysis and went through a lot of pain to try to come up 
with sort of the perfect brand extension in the mid-market space. Mm -hmm. And I said, there are also others that are not taking as much uh, due diligence. So today, there's a lot of uh, brands at every uh, sort of gap, everywhere on that spectrum, is I've mm -hmm. seen some that are sort of feel a little rushed and don't have a lot of big sort of bones or stories behind the brand and others that spend a lot of time really thoughtfully creating new brands. So it's a it's, it's a big range. And one thing I'm wondering is how long does it take one of these major hotel companies to come up with a brand? So for me, for example, I'm thinking, you know, I was born and raised in Maine, so I, you know, would drive home for the holidays and stuff. And I feel like, you know, some these hotel chains would just simply pop up on my drive on the Mass Pike, um, just really out of nowhere. So how long does it take some of these major companies to develop these brands? Is it years and years and years of work, or is it very quick, like a year or so? Fair question. And the answer to that question, and I know this is going to sound like a cop-out, and most questions like it are those two magical words, it depends. And it really does. And it depends on the, so I'll give you a couple of different scenarios. So if there's, a, if there's a brand being created in a lucrative but otherwise crowded space, trying to find the white space, the term often used for sort of an open market or unserved or underserved market, can be uh, kind of time consuming. It can really, you know, to figure out where exactly the brand needs to be positioned to either uh, compete or, or extinguish an existing brand or come up with something that might appeal to the market. If there's something that's a completely new white space, uh, that's a whole different experience. So the good news is it's an open space. I'll give you a little uh, experiment that I did. So what are my version of ChatGPT? And I asked ChatGPT two questions. Kind of brand, your branding uh, participants will be interested in this. The first mm -hmm. question I asked was, so what are the hotel brand trends looking into the future? And ChatGPT, as you can imagine, said to me, I don't have future data. <laughs> Uh, I'm limited. So that was a no. And then mm -hmm. I said, create a create a brand for me targeted towards millennials. And mm -hmm. ChatGPT, lo and behold, said to me, if I was creating a brand for millennials, I would create an eco-luxury brand. And so mm -hmm. I immediately emailed uh, a favorite former student of mine who works for SH Hotel saying, please tell Mr. Sternlich, CEO of SH, that uh, is genius. You know, that <laughs> even ChatGPT agrees that there is a viable market for one hotels and again uh, ex you know experienced by their expansion very rapid expansion so the the technology is getting better the knowledge base is getting better with large language models we have a lot more that we can rely on to do some of this work for us do some of this lifting so it's a time consuming process that can take a lot of time a lot of thought and a lot of people mm -hmm. also expensive process we're talking you know, tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes in terms of creating a new viable, really uh, key brand. Sometimes it's just a matter of a light bulb going on. The final mm -hmm. example I'll give you is when I was doing some work for IAG, they launched the Holiday Express brand. And the Holiday Express brand is one of the fastest growing brands in the history of the lodging business where they found that there was an opportunity to create sort of a Holiday Inn uh branded hotel, but that was at a lower price point, sort of new bills at the time, mostly new bills that really mm -hmm. appealed to the marketplace. So it, it can really uh, vary quite a bit. And when we're thinking about, you know, the time it takes to develop some of these brands and everything like that, how much market research is out there when it comes to, okay, we're trying to target this specific white space. This is what these customers are looking for. There are a lot of companies that either publish reports uh, on different markets and where the, uh, you know, where the opportunities are. So for example, the opportunity might be in creating a new brand or taking a brand into a new space. Uh, I had coffee recently with a gentleman who wrote a report in, I believe it was 2013 for HVS on the Miami market and predicting that Miami is going to be the next big major gateway city for a lot of brands. And lo and behold, I'm in, Miami Beach, and I'm noticing mm -hmm. that there's, you know, uh, many luxury brands coming up almost all simultaneously, Bulgari, Amman, uh, Rosewood, mm -hmm. this, you know, Ritz Carlton, there's another Ritz Carlton, there's a lot of other brands looking at that space. So there are published reports, mm -hmm. there are also companies that are doing very good custom work, where you can tell them, I'm looking for to create a brand in this particular space, or I'm ha just look at the whole market and tell me where the white spaces are. Mm -hmm. There are companies that are outside the business. I mentioned the Ralph Lauren study where they said we want to, we're in, uh, you know, we're in apparel, we're in 
perfumes, we're in home goods, we need another category. And I believe it was McKinsey did some work for them that told them that the next best thing for them, the next category, where to extend their brand beyond where they are now would be hotel. So lots of great uh, technologies, reports, and companies doing some very good work advising brands on uh, the best ways to move forward. And how do brand managers kind of balance this, um, I guess, this idea of, okay, we have this specific white space in mind, but then we have to take it to our CEO and make sure they're good with it. How do they kind of balance that and let you know the CEO know, like, hey, this is an investment, this is a good idea? So in one aforementioned case, uh, the details of which I cannot mention, I actually am privy to exchanges of emails there are, mm -hmm. and where the CEO is actually involved in picking the font size or the point size oh, of wow. the brand. It's, oh, yes. <laughs> so it can get as detailed as that, <laughs> all the way up to uh, a committee or a group of people, of stakeholders. Uh, it can be, it could involve, you know, within, mostly within firm people. It could involve customers. It could involve, for example, in, in the courtyards case, I believe they actually put the, put the, hotel on a uh, trailer truck and transport around the world, around the country and had different people sort of check it out and oh, walk wow. through and see it. When W hotels or when Westin hotels introduced the heavenly bed, they actually had the beds laid out on Wall Street to get the traders in the morning that were coming to work to actually sit in the beds and try them out. So lots of ways in which to do this and lots of um, permutation combinations of how many people are involved. The smart mm -hmm. ones are considering multiple stakeholders. So they're looking at not just guests, they're looking at employees, as in what will it take to service the brand and the mm -hmm. promises the brand is making. So looking at mm -hmm. customers that value the brand and the features that are offered, they're looking at employees, they're looking at, of course, the owners that are going to be paying for some mm -hmm. of these amenities services or for the new brand. They're looking at financial institutions that are looking at the model and saying, is this something that's viable? They're looking at communities because mm -hmm. Today, in the interest of sustainability and lowering a carbon footprint, are there communities that would value a certain brand because of what impact it has on the local community? So smart brands are looking at multiple stakeholders and really carefully considering all the elements when it comes to putting together either an improvement to a brand or a, or a brand new brand. Yeah, I remember staying in a Westin in Lake Mary near the Orlando area, and I, I absolutely loved it. I cannot say too many good things about it, but... I loved it. Um, now that we're thinking about kind of the brands, how important is it for some of these brands to think about it from the employee perspective? So I'm thinking about, uh, you know, exclusive luxury brand, for example, might need a lot of employees to help, um, you know, service some of the folks that stay there. How important is it to take it from the employee's perspective and understand that maybe an economy brand hotel might not need as many employees to help um, support the brand? Uh, it's critical. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, so I wrote a case study for the Harvard Business School on Westin's hotels uh, transition mm -hmm. from a product-oriented brand, the Heavenly Bed, the Heavenly Bath, the Heavenly Spa, to more of a service mm -hmm. experience-oriented brand, something that they're paying more attention to. Sort of the five senses is multi-sensory branding, paying attention to the sounds and the sights mm -hmm. and, the, and the smells within the brand. In the end, the people that are going to deliver the brand are the frontline employees and the employees mm -hmm. within the property. So it's absolutely critical to involve people at all levels to make sure that the brand is not only properly conceived, but it can be successfully implemented. So getting employees involved in the brand ahead of time to me is a, is a critical part of this. And sometimes not doing that can cause a breakdown. So for example, mm -hmm. one example that comes to mind is when a lot of the boutique hotel brands were in, were created, uh, while they looked and felt great, when they when people actually showed up to these hotels and had these very uh, good looking, smartly dressed, design forward employees and spaces, they just didn't work because they did not consider the execution of the brand, did not consider the the customer's journey and to what extent that that customer's journey would be fulfilled. So that's when they do that. I think it's a it's a genius move when they don't. I think that becomes mm -hmm. a... And I'll, the last example I'll give you is, I remember somebody relating the story to me of the heavenly bed at Westin was first created. And the CEO at the time proposed an all-white bed. 
and housekeeping. I remember saying to the CEO that, you know, it's very hard to keep it clean and it picks up dirt. And But the CEO's insistence was, well, it gives it a sense of not only cleanliness, but also space. Mm -hmm. And so the the customer-centric viewpoint won out in that case. where They said, we'll figure out a way to make it work as long as there's a wow with the customer. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it's somebody making the trade-offs between the ideal that the employee would want and the ideal that the customer would want and the ideal that the owner would want and how to sort of finesse the preferences of all three groups, I think, is a, is as much a science as, as much as it is an art. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I... I'm thinking about, you know, my stay in Weston in Florida and the different artwork and just the visuals. It was it was amazing. Uh, but obviously the title of our keynote is, you know, that there's going to be a reckoning at some point um, when it comes to these hundreds and hundreds of different hotel brands. When do you think this will happen? So by my analysis and estimation, the hotel brandscape has become a zero-sum game. What do I mean by that? One piece of data that supports this thesis is that many brands' growth plans today include over 50% conversions. So for example, uh, one of the items that we discussed in setting up this keynote was Hilton announce Hilton's announcement of Spark. And it's clearly mentioned mm -hmm. that Spark is intended to be what we call a conversion brand. And that mm -hmm. is converting from either another brand to a brand or independent to brand. This mm -hmm. conversion that a lot of the companies, a lot of the brands are considering as sort of a, a key to their growth is in some way can be seen sort of a beggar thy neighbor brand strategy. Mm -hmm. That's led hotel firms to create brands with little more than a logo and shortchange hotel owners by not protecting their trading area sufficiently. So imagine that there's a, a new brand coming up that's going to uh, look at conversions, now all of a sudden they have to worry about who else is in the marketplace and to what extent will their business be affected. And spreading brand resources thinly across brands, starving them of nourishment they need and deserve. So one of the challenges of having very large portfolios, a core as I mentioned, 43 or 46, I lose count sometimes, is making sure that every brand in the portfolio has sufficient resources, mm -hmm. sufficient nourishment for the brand to, to survive. If you're trying to spread your resources, company resources across so many brands, the question becomes, do each, does each individual brand get the nourishment it needs? And so when I teach my courses to some of these brand managers, I tell them that if you're an independent, you have to worry about these large brands trying to put you out of business. But if you're a branded hotel, you have to worry about the fact that are you getting the resources you need and fighting for those. So brand managers mm -hmm. I speak to on a daily basis or regular basis, and I have several former students that do this, Mm -hmm. is they say it's not just getting resources for my brand, but it's also making sure that if I come up with a new idea, mm -hmm. my sister or brother brand doesn't steal the idea from me and try to make it part of their brand DNA. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is how do you get the resources for the brand? How do you make sure you're allowed to swim within your lane with your own unique set of resources and make sure that you have that to survive and succeed? So going forward, I predict a tsunami of lawsuits, Bidding hotel owners against brands for lacking basic and essential, what I call standard of care, when mm -hmm. it comes to creating, managing, and maximizing brand value. Mm -hmm. So, um, what does that kind of transition look like? That conversion from you know one brand to the next. And now that I'm thinking about it, you you might be a part of a couple more lawsuits in the in the future, Jackie. But uh, <laughs> maybe we'll discuss that in a different keynote. But what does that conversion kind of look like when it comes to you know taking one brand, maybe shelving it, and then kind of transitioning it into a different brand? So it's a it's a big question, an important question, and actually I. Uh, with a couple of co-authors published a journal of marketing research case study and also a different version for Cornell. And that is looking at this whole issue of rebranding. So it's a very rich mm -hmm. subject. And I guess the, the key uh, takeaway from the study we did was that there's a lot of rebranding going on. And sometimes rebranding pays and sometimes it doesn't. We looked at ind individual brands. Our data was not large enough. The sample was not large enough to look at brands individually because each individual brand didn't have the kind of representation we needed. But what we did find was sometimes converting from brand A to brand B actually increased the company or the hotel's top and bottom line. And sometimes it diminished the hotel's top and bottom line. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of it happening. Uh, there's a lot of uh, some now research looking at to what extent this rebranding activity. But it kind of gets confusing for customers because... Mm -hmm. What you thought was your hotel with that brand name in that particular location, when you arrive in that destination, the next time it may be called something else. Mm -hmm. And then the owners have to make a very 
careful analysis of if I convert from brand A to brand B, sometimes given the attendant investments required, I mentioned PIP or property improvement programs or plans earlier, mm -hmm. is does the improvement, uh, so I, one example I gave you was, for example, the, uh, the phasing out of IAG's Holiday and Select. Mm -hmm. When they did that, they gave uh, owners two options. They said you can either move to a Holiday Inn brand, the mainline Holiday Inn brand, or you can move to a Crown Plaza brand with some investment. You have to decide, given your marketplace, if there's in fact a half a notch higher potential in the market, you can invest in the brand and take it to a Crown Plaza level from the select. So again, it depends sort of on a market by market basis, but clearly a lot of activity in, in sort of specializing within that space and helping owners uh, realize the maximum value of their asset. And we got a bunch of audience questions in, and I want to make sure I get to those, but I have just one last question for you, um, and I promise we'll get to those audience questions. Um, but I want to ask, you know, what does this reckoning look like for the customer when this re reckoning ultimately happens? So the reckoning for the customer is uh, a, a more confusing sea of sameness, <laughs> and not only, a, not only a confusing sea, but a turbulent sea. And by that I mean... More and more brands fighting for shelf space, more and more brands, brands shouting a little louder and more frequently in a crowded marketplace, but also a lot of changes. So when there's transitions from brand A to brand B, then all of a sudden you have customers trying to figure out which brand belongs to which brand family and which loyalty program and where do I go and what does that mean? For your uh, you know, listeners and viewers' benefit, I just looked at one example. So I looked at Hyatt. And I try to figure out all the brands listed under the Hyatt family. And very quickly, Park Hyatt, Grand Hyatt, Hyatt Regency, Hyatt, Hyatt Vacation, Hyatt Place, Hyatt House, Hyatt Studios, Hyatt uh, Miraval, Alila, Andaz, Thompson, Dream, Hyatt Centric, Caption, the list goes on and on and on. And so when you think about consumers dealing with companies that have all these brands on offer, the challenge then becomes for them to very clearly communicate to certain people in certain ways exactly what it, each brand stands for so they can make uh, informed and smart choices. Perfect. And I just actually got a great question in from Ben. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll try to kind of transition over to some of our audience questions. Sure. And Ben yeah. asks, uh, hi, Professor Dev, great to see you, MMH 2009. So a few <laughs> years ago, uh, do you see any brands creating brands then discontinuing them as they see other similar brands be more successful or better meeting customer needs? Thank you for that question, Ben. In fact, I had a question on LinkedIn of the same order. There's actually a Wikipedia page, believe it or not, of mm -hmm. brands that have been phased out. So if you want a complete list, it's a pretty good list of brands of, that have been phased out. One that I'm intimately familiar with is, uh, was, as I mentioned, a subject for a lawsuit between the owner of a holiday and select who had spent quite a bit of time investing in the brand, creating the brand, getting the brand better known, in their marketplace, and when the brand was being phased out, they actually sued IEG for doing that. And the, my, I opine that in that instance, IEG's phase out of select was actually a textbook example of how to do it well. Is companies recognizing when we have too many brands, maybe sometimes it come, there's a time to sunset the brand and do it in an in a intelligent, thoughtful, and a logical way that serves the interests of all the stakeholders involved. Another company I worked with, Accor, took out some of its brands. So they took out a top and four seasons, all seasons, I'm sorry, and they decided they would merge all those properties into the uh, into the EBIS brand and create a three-tier EBIS brand structure, which I thought was very smartly done. So great examples. Look at that uh, uh, Wikipedia page and you'll hopefully get some more insights. And again, thank you for the question. Thanks, Ben. And it's interesting you mentioned a core because I actually just got a great question in from Will Fieldhouse. So Will asks, I'm interested to hear you mention a core. As an American, I don't hear it discussed often. I was a GM for a core for 24 years in Asia. A core now has 40 plus brands. Can some companies approach a negative tipping point with simply too many brands become too confusing? The short answer to that is yes. It, it's very easy to it's very easy to create too many brands because it's easy to do, and mm -hmm. sometimes that leads to uh, maybe going beyond. Again, and it, you have to think about not just the number of brands in the portfolio, how they're organized. I know Accor has gone through a lot of transitions in terms of organizing its people around its brands and how they mm -hmm. want to call them and the tiers, and also spreading resources across all these brands. To your point about not well known in the U.S., Accor has tried over the last at least the 30 or so years I've been following them 
is with not much success in penetrating the U.S. market in a significant way. They did buy, mm. as you as you well know, Motel 6, for example, mm. and they tried to roll out Novotel and Sofitel, but for whatever reason, uh, not as successful as they've been in, say, Europe, uh, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. And is it often just kind of piggybacking off that, that some some of these major brands try to hit different markets, not just different cities, but, you know, like the Asian market, for example, or the European market? What does that look like when they're trying to create a new brand specifically for a certain um, segment or cer- certain population? Again, another great question. I'll give you an example. So going back 30, 35, 40 years, mm-hmm. Four Seasons as a brand was really well known in the North American and beginning to be known in the European market. Mm -hmm. Regent, as a luxury brand, was expanding its presence in Asia. So Regent was a very well-known Asian luxury brand. Four Seasons was a well-known North American European luxury brand. And Four Seasons bought Regent. It actually combined, and I did this exercise in class, where I looked at on on a war map the dots that Four Seasons represents and the dots that Regent represents, and they really was a perfect fit where Four Seasons was, where Region wasn't, and Region was where Four Seasons wasn't. So that made for a, a really harmonious integration of two great, two great brands. You know, somebody mentioned the, the question from Accor. Novotel was the, comp- the, the the brand with which Accor started was primarily a European brand, and it sort of grew from that. So sometimes it's a country of origin, Mandarin sort of being more of an Asian brand, Oberoi being an Asian brand. So they start from a certain location and then try to become relevant across the world. It's very easy to say, very hard to do, but some mm-hmm. brands have done it uh, more than others. I think Four Seasons has been on a learning journey for the last 50 years and really learned mm-hmm. how to make its brand relevant across all geographies, not just its home market. So mm-hmm. it can be done. And I just got another great question, and Imran checks in, and they ask, would you share your outlook for the microtel segment? Any key drivers, tips for successful positioning, branding? Would offering lower ADR a key factor in capturing shares from economy segment hotels? So Chris Nassetta, CEO of Hilton, is on record at a travel conference saying that uh, he is a big fan of creating sort of this micro uh, urban brand. So mm-hmm. when you think about micro hotels or the micro hotels in various forms, uh, believe it or not, a few years ago, Accor actually flirted with the idea of creating a brand in sort of the hostel space, that is youth Hmm. hostels and brands that are even shared accommodations and shared bathrooms. So so Hmm. looking at the market worldwide, there are a lot of people coming into the travel space in terms of new generations. Mm -hmm. I call them the emerging markets, emerging markets of customers, not geographies. Mm -hmm. And by definition, when they're just in starting out in the work world, they need to have a brand that's more accessible, that's more affordable. So there's a tremendous opportunity at the what we call the base of the pyramid. I think mm-hmm. there was an announcement recently of a major company that is going to try to create these infamous Japanese pod hotels, which actually look like, hmm. pardon the expression, like a coffin. You literally have just <laughs> enough space to lay down. Okay. You, can the, you can move the TV controls with your toes, kind of along, and you have a, a common hangar and a common bathroom space in the, in the UK market. Mm-hmm. So clearly the... There's tremendous opportunity to create new and innovative concepts at the base of the pyramid. So when people are entering the market, the lodging for hire, lodging for pay market, they have a place to go. And then they can then over time, as they get uh, make more money and get up in their careers, they can afford the more uh, upper level, middle level, upper level brands. I don't know if I would want to stay in a coffin. That might be that <laughs> might be a, a bridge too far for me. Maybe you in my think, younger. Here's days. a scenario: you're you're working in an office. You're going. You're parting out with your uh, office mates, which is not uncommon, as you know, in the Japanese work workplace. Mm-hmm. And you're drinking till ten, eleven, twelve, one in the morning. And rather than take the subway to go home, mm-hmm. you go to the train station. You find one of these things. You're you're pretty much uh, oblivious of your circumstances <laughs> by this time. So you're basically just a place to sleep and then get up the next morning and go to work. So that I understand that when, mm-hmm. when we were in Japan, we were taken on a tour of these mm-hmm. what they call capsule hotels. Is that's the purpose? Is giving somebody a safe giving somebody a safe place to crash for the night if they don't have the time mm-hmm. or the energy to get get home and come back the next day and that uh, a, a safe, comfortable place. You know, your eyes are closed anyway, so it's <laughs> like going to an MRI machine with, with eye, eye shade so that you're. Uh, 
you know, you're not worried about what's around you. You close your eyes in your sleep, and when you get up in the morning, you get up and go anyway. See, capsule hotel, perfect. Yeah. I would yeah. absolutely stay at a capsule hotel. Right. <laughs> um, and with that, actually, Jennifer checks in with a great question, um, and this is getting a little bit in the weeds. But Jennifer asks: Is technology a different differentiator of a brand? Can a brand new, or rather, can a brand grow market share and find new customers by investing in tech? Absolutely. So the, it's, a, it's a complicated, a very good uh, question that needs a lot of time. So in the brief time we have, I'll say to you that my prediction for our business now, having been in the business for 45 years almost, is that we're moving from a high-touch model in terms of technology to more of a high-tech model. One of the examples that I use in my class is a prototype developed next to Alibaba's headquarters called hmm. FlyZoo. And FlyZoo is almost entirely technology-based. So you'll see artificial intelligence, machine learning, sort of the, the self-service with a very high-tech way using robots and others, you know, all digital interfaces, biometric readings. Uh, again, it depends on the tier of the market. Clearly, mm -hmm. there is much more opportunity for a high-tech journey at the low end, low end, maybe low and middle end, maybe more on the business side or the leisure side. Maybe there's always going to be opportunities for more high touch in the upper end. But I often say if you are able to take some routine activities and mm -hmm. transfer them to high tech so that the employees are available to handle non-routine urgent matters. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I checked into the Breakers Palm Beach, one of my favorite hotels. And I was told that I can ask for electronically, digitally ask for service 24 hours a day with a little a message on my app as opposed to picking up a house phone or talking to an employee and for me that was the perfect solution because it was really an important issue i could i could corral an employee but when it was sort of a, sort of a routine issue i could use technology to do that and Chucky, thank you so much for joining us i always am amazed at your depth of knowledge and i always learn something new um before we wrap up just one last question if you could you know, reach out to our audience, give them one piece of advice or one thing to think about as we're thinking about, you know, hotel branding in the future, or this potential brand reckoning. What's that one piece you would want the audience to kind of walk away with or learn today? So a somewhat unexpected response to your question, and that is to say the one piece of advice is getting a hotel brand to stand out in a crowded marketplace is not that different from getting your own personal brand to stand out in increasingly complex and cluttered employee marketplace. So think of the five pillars I talked about. Think about being bold, think about being relevant, think about being authentic, think about being novel, and think about being different, right? In the end, mm -hmm. the, if there was a final point to leave you with, I'll leave you with my formula. And the formula, success formula for branding and hospitality is differentiation equals profit. I'm sorry, differentiation equals premium and premium equals profit. If you're able to substantially, meaningfully, sustainably differentiate yourself, you will earn your premium, which is the ultimate test of any good brand. And if you earn your premium, you know that extra dollar goes almost all to the bottom line. So differentiation equals premium and premium equals profit. Perfect. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us. Audience, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Um, one last quick thing. We want to know how we did. Uh, scan the QR code with your phone and just give us a little bit of feedback. Tell us where we can improve. But again, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us. Audience, My thank you. My thanks as well to you, Nick, and to the audience. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you found this useful. Yes, very much so. An audience, thank you, and we'll see you at the next keynote, and have a great afternoon.